Then I realized what practice is. Practice is being by yourself, doing a thing that you may not necessarily love, but you must do it anyway. Welcome. You're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 468, with today's guest, Sensei TJ Storm. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, show host and Whistlekick founder, and everything we do at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to see everything we do, check out whistlekick.com. That's the place to learn about all of our projects and our products. It's also the easiest way to find those things that you can buy. And if you visit the store, make sure you use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. Martial Arts Radio gets its own website. That's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We keep it easy. And this show comes out twice a week. Now, our goal here at Whistlekick is to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. And if you want to help the show and the work that we do, you can do a number of things. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick everywhere. Tell a friend, maybe pick up one of our books on Amazon, leave a review, or support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick, that's the place to go. Patreon's a place where we post exclusive content. And if you contribute as little as $5 a month, you get access to all of it. So you can not only thank us for the things that we give you for free, but get even more. There are a number of ways you may know today's guest. He's been in movies. He's been on TV, video games. He's provided voiceovers. He's quite the Renaissance man. But he's also a martial artist. And on today's episode, we talk about how he got that star in the martial arts and how it served him so well as he's gone on to his chosen career. Let's bring him on. Well, how are you? Let's start there. I'm really, really good. Uh, I took a break during the holiday season yeah. because you get kind of plugged in and sure. you don't know how plugged in you are until you unplug. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that I agree. I don't know that I've unplugged recently enough to uh, agree out of experience. I would I, like uh, to. <laughs> you know, I, I, I almost never do. And it, the life of a, of a artist usually doesn't have that much work in it. Mm. So you, I, I don't know how everybody else is, but I, I was like a starving artist. I knew I was going to be a starving artist when I first started. I was a dancer. And... I knew I wasn't going to work that much. I, you, you do a job for a while, maybe a week or two weeks, or you do a music video or whatever. And you just get used to the rhythm of, I'm going to work and make some money, then I'm going to twiddle my thumbs for a couple of months. And mm. then maybe I'll do it again someday. So you just plan for that. You plan to eat like that. You plan to uh, do entertainment that way. You don't go to too many parties because you simply cannot afford to. <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you just lock down. And I, I lived the first several years like that. Mm. I, the one thing I, I did do for my brain was play video games. So, because they have a great value. When you buy it, you can play it, play it over again if you want. Right. So I do play video games and that is my go-to <laughs> ultra zen thing. When I, what what I, kind of games? I play League of Legends, which is a PC. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I'm also kind of playing uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Nice. On console, but nice. yeah, hey, I'm. I'm. That's what I did. I unplugged and played video games, and it was amazing. And it's funny because I, I think a lot of people would would say that's not unplugging, but when you talk about it that way, I completely get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I I do go on hikes and stuff like that, uh, but there's no humans there, <laughs> right? <laughs> and and I like that. I I need to be away from because. Oddly, you start to know everybody near where you live, and a lot of people hike. So I will inevitably meet people. I'll talk, and hey, you should come over to this thing. And I don't want to come over to any more things right now. <laughs> I was so happy <laughs> to do no things. So I completely just—that's how I unplugged. I unplugged from humanity and just played with digital. Theme. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know the comedian John Mulaney. Mm -hmm. He he does this great bit talking about how when you're a teenager, doing nothing over the weekend is is just it's the worst thing in the world. But mm -hmm. as an adult, doing nothing over the weekend is Which the is greatest. <laughs> it's the one thing you look forward. To. What, what 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 did you do this weekend? I I, I did nothing. It was it was <laughs> amazing. 
exactly. It's awesome. Exactly. <laughs> or even better, I, I, he describes uh, canceling a thing. You know, not doing a thing as an adult is as akin to uh, uh, yes. drug use. Yes, it's a bad thing that is so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That is brilliant, actually. It, it is. He's he's one of my favorites. He's. I think he's he's got a pretty good grasp on reality and, and what we're all experiencing. No doubt. Yeah. Well, you know, if you don't mind, mm-hmm. I would like us to just keep rolling. Ah, no problem. I mean, we 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 got some good stuff there, and why not let the audience hear it? Oh, that sounds great. Cool. Cool. We'll we'll introduce you in the intro and everything, and and they'll know who oh. you are. And, Cool, right? Yeah, so we can just keep talking. Sounds great. Sounds great. Awesome. Let's talk about martial arts, though. Let's, you know, we we've got that base question that we kind of have to get to, and then we can spider off from there. And it's, I mean, it's pretty root. So I hope you don't mind answering it. It's, no, what? What? How'd you get started? Ah, uh, hmm. I got. It was. It was really quite simple. My mom made me do it. Uh, <laughs> she made you? No, she didn't actually make me. She made me stay. Okay. Uh, she, when, when I was really young, uh, I, she, I started piano lessons and I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. I was a little kid. So she goes, do, do you really like this? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, you need a piano to practice at home because it's all about practice. And I was like, yeah, 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 sure. And she's like, you don't know. Not yeah, yeah, sure. We're not rich. If I get a piano, it's going to be a big thing. Our family is going to have to invest in you. We have to get a piano. So do you want to do piano? I was like, yeah, 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 sure. So <laughs> they got a piano. And then I realized what practice is. Practice is being by yourself, doing a thing that you may not necessarily love, but you must do it anyway. <laughs> mm. And I was like, I don't want to be inside. I want to be outside playing. I was like five or six. I was really, really young. And I got really good. Uh, I started doing recitals and stuff like that but i hated practicing just sitting there and occasionally my piano teacher would whack my wrists for resting them on the, the piano corner and I had my hands above the keys and i did not like any of it i'm like no i'm done and i just went outside and played i refused to practice anymore. i was a little kid and there goes the entire investment in the piano and my mom's like don't all right fine 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 he, he wants to be outside let him so it finally got to, uh, we moved to Hawaii when I was really, really young. And I was really tall for my age. And I was super skinny and gangly. And it looked like I would trip over my own shadow at any given time. And worse, I was hyperactive. So clumsy and hyperactive are not a pretty combination. But my, my mom found out about martial arts. And she's like, they, she found that it helped with discipline and uh, all of the things that I kind of needed. I needed focus, I needed discipline, I needed coordination. And she found a school near me. She goes, hey, do you want, and she saw me every Saturday, I was watching Black Belt Theater. There was all these guys doing Kung Fu and Karate and Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan. And I was watching them all the time. And uh, she's like, oh, do you want to try that? Do you want to do martial arts? I'm like, yeah. So um, we went and then, uh, he goes, oh, come back for another free lesson. And I went again. And it was fun. You get to try to hit people. You get to, it's like playing tag as a little kid. And so my mom sits me down. Well, you, you did your two free classes. Do you want to go again? And I'm like, yeah, this is great. I get the whole belt and the cool outfit just like in the movies. This is cool. And uh, she goes, well, it's an investment. We're going to have to commit to at least three months. Are you sure you want to do this? Because our family has to invest in your future. I'm like, yeah, of course, sure. <laughs> Just like How I old did. are you at this time? <clears throat> I'm seven, maybe. <laughs> sure. <laughs> seven. sure. So no real idea of consequence. <laughs> Not if pain is a good teacher. So <laughs> my my parents had learned from me saying, Yeah, sure, I'll do it. Now I was about to learn the lesson. So I committed to it and then uh, I started going to class and we had to do uh bunkai. We had to do uh techniques where somebody's punching you and you have to block, you have to actually utilize the technique. It's the application of the technique. And it's fine to do it once if you manage to do it right, but doing it three times, four times, 20 times, <clears throat> that's bone against bone eventually. And eventually it started, it started to hurt, which I did not expect. I was like, oh, 
back contacts. It kind of hurts. And I started getting little bruises and stuff. I was like, ah, pain. Oh, well, that was fun. What's next? And I thought I was going to quit. My mom's like, no, you committed. Now, you committed once in the past, and we kind of let it go. But you're older now, and now you're going to learn what that means. I'm like, what, what, what's that mean? She goes, it means you're going back to karate. I'm like, fine. So I go back, and then I got dinged up again. And you keep, keep getting banged up, dinged up. And after a while, I really wanted to sneak out of class. I just not wanted not to be there. Uh, but I started getting belts also. I started training. They started making me do stuff. And at, at, at that young age, you don't know how hard or how easy a thing is. I didn't know either and I just started to learn and after a while I started developing a small group of skills when I was eight nine ten uh I could catch the bus to karate no big deal but I wanted to quit uh, more than a couple of times especially when I got kicked for the first time you get hit for the first time you fail doing the thing I wanted to quit my mom kept saying gotta go you can't quit you never give up you do a thing and then Eventually, you can make a decision if you want to do the thing or not do the thing. <clears throat> and she even came to class with me for a little while to show that she could do it. Now, my mom was not in the best shape. She was a little bit overweight, but, uh, and she had a little bit of arthritis, especially in her knees. But she went to class in, to teach me that lesson and to also make sure that I didn't sneak out of class. And <laughs> she was down there with the white belts when I was an orange belt or a purple belt. And I saw her do it. And I'm like, man, if my mom better than that and i did and she never let me quit and as a result i have an entire life an entire career that is largely uh centered on the martial arts and everything that it taught me and those things are not only physical skills but uh mental uh, mental and spiritual as well i think aspects of that story likely resonate with a number of the people listening i, I think anybody who trained as a child wanted to quit at some point i know mm -hmm. i certainly did mm -hmm. and I'm curious, how much of it, as you got further in, the, the resistance to letting you quit, how much of that was simply trying to teach you the lesson of, you know, you're, you're sticking something out? And how much of it was, if any, I guess, your mother seeing that you had some skill and wanting you to develop that? Very little was that I had skill. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I had no skill. I was... I, I was a string bean. I was always in the center back row in my class pictures when I was a kid because I was the tallest kid, almost always. And, I, and I'm 6'2 now, but I had just happened to grow really fast. So I'm not an unusually tall adult, but for a kid, I grew really, really fast. And I was always the tallest person in most of the pictures, almost every year, every time. So I was really, really clumsy. Worse, I was super hyperactive. I could not sit still. I couldn't sit in class. I'd be shaking my legs. I'd be bouncing around. I'd be drawing pictures in the corner of my book, trying to make animated images move. I was always doing something. And then I'd be cracking jokes also because my mind was just racing, looking for something to do to keep me occupied, to keep me busy. Because I was so bored with the droning teacher talking about history of whatever was the subject was. And it drove my teachers insane. It, it distracted the students. It was horrible. And I couldn't focus. I'd like, oh, what's new? Oh, what's that? Ooh, this squirrel. Ah, butterflies. And I'd just be bouncing off the walls. So I was not a natural talent in any way, shape, or form, not even a little bit. Now, the amazing thing is if you take unbridled energy and manage to put it in the container, it'll eventually take the shape of the container, which is kind of cool. All that energy allowed me to oddly when it was focused on we i mean when all the energy is focused on surviving not getting kicked not getting hit not getting punched and sometimes doing something fun which is largely the martial arts uh, that's the base description when you're a kid uh survive and sometimes fun <laughs> and uh that's what it was based on uh i didn't want to get hit anymore at least not in the place where i had the last bruise i didn't want to get kicked again because that knocks the wind out of you. You pain is a good teacher. You start learning the things that you're there for. And if you listen even a little bit, you don't have to listen to all of it. If you listen to even a little bit, which is all that I could do because my mind didn't work that way at the time, 
uh, this is well before they gave anybody Ritalin, uh, I was forced to focus. My teachers were Japanese, and the original style that I studied was Shitoryu, and um, it was hardcore. So imagine a spastic little kid in a traditional karate class in Hawaii, taught by uh, an instructor who, Shuzo Kataka at the time, uh, which was an amazing, amazing instructor, an incredible martial artist, but he didn't speak a lot of English, or at least he didn't speak it to us. Uh, so it was no nonsense. And so that was the container that I was given. And I put all that energy into, into the container without even knowing it, because I didn't have a whole lot of choice, which you probably don't as a kid. Uh, and so I did the thing that was in front of me, uh, whether I liked it or not, I was doing it. And it shaped, it shaped my way of thinking about discipline, about learning, about uh, mastering a skill. Whether I knew it or not at the time, it shaped my future. And that I am beyond thankful for, primarily to my mom and to all the amazing instructors that I've had over my life. Now, at what point did martial arts go from obligation to something that was a choice? <sighs> Around the time, I, I, I think it was a blue belt. I was getting older, I was maybe 11 or 12 or 13. and. I'm starting to get into uh, what, what's right before high school? Is that middle Facebook school, grade? junior high? Middle school, on yeah, yeah. Where yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, middle school, junior high. Um, I started to own the skills that I was doing. It was part of my day. It was now my day. Uh, it was not something my mom told me I had to do. It was simply, um, oh, you finish school, you have. Uh, about a half an hour or an hour before you have to be in class. And I was saying that to myself. So I would either choose to go play basketball with my friends and then walk down to class or try to do some of my homework and then walk down to class. But it, I scheduled it myself. It was, I took ownership of it. Then I would catch the bus home. Uh, and that's just how it was for me. I, I didn't think about it anymore. And it was a mechanical part of my day. I did not love it. I'm like, oh, boy, I get to go to karate. It was not the thought. It was um, you brush your teeth, you go to school, you go to karate, uh, maybe you do the homework. So <laughs> because that was more important than uh, the boring, not moving uh, idea of doing mental work uh, for me. And that's kind of the way it was. So I, it was a mechanical part of my day that I absolutely did. Um, it wasn't until later that I started taking pride in uh, the movements themselves. Uh, after a while, I started to, because I would practice, uh, which is sadly something I see that many of my students don't do, or many students in other schools don't do. They don't actually go home. They don't actually practice. I still had that kind of energy, that just unbridled energy but now it was more focused so i focused it into practicing when i was at home i remember i would go to chinatown uh i think in in hawaii there's a street called hotel street and at the time it was a a seedier district but it also had all these uh small chinese uh kind of shops like pawn shops if you ever saw the movie gremlins there was a lot of shops like the shop they found the gremlins in and those shops had comic books in them but they also had behind the glass where the, the, the person sat that you paid for the comic books, that's where the martial art weapons were. So they had shurikens and nunchakus and all this stuff. And I'm like, I was mesmerized by the idea because I was still watching Black Belt Theater and I just loved those things. So I was like, and let me get a shuriken. And the lady would be like, how old you? <laughs> I'm like, uh, 15. Not old enough. <laughs> she knew. I was trying to lie through my teeth. <laughs> and she wouldn't give me a, a sharp and shuriken, but she would give me the rubber one. So I would buy those. And eventually, uh, I, I got my hand on a real shuriken and some nunchucks. And I would take them home and I would practice nunchaku uh, outside. I would practice my forms outside. And pretty soon, the story of the martial arts, the romantic uh, storytelling and, and the mythology of martial arts started to fill my mind and fuel my passion for training and my passion for uh, practicing. I want to go back to that word you used, that you took ownership. 
of your martial arts, of your karate. And I, I don't think that that word choice was accidental. It sounds like there's, there's been a lot of contemplation at that time of your life. And I'm just curious if you might unpack that a little bit more. It's not a word I've ever heard anyone use to describe anything at that age. Um, I, I, like I said, I, I was, I probably, I didn't have this word at the time, but, uh, what do you call it when you're, uh, you can't focus on a single thing? ADHD? ADHD, yeah, distracted. Yeah. Yes. I, I, they would have told me that I had that and they would have given me medication. I have no doubt about that. But the martial arts gave me a place to put all that wild energy. And at first it was about survival and, uh, and fun. Those two ideas make you focus, whether you like it or not. If you're having fun at a thing, you'll do the thing because you like to. And if you're trying to survive and not get hit or not die, you will focus. Those things will make you focus, even if you have ADHD. So at the time, the pain was real. If somebody tried to kick me, even if it was a sparring kick, I didn't know that there was a softer version and a harder version of that kick. I just knew that getting kicked hurt, period. So that was survival to me at the time. And uh, those things made me focus. But after a while, I started to choose if I wanted to get kicked or not get kicked. Uh, sometimes the, the person I was sparring with was good enough to kick me. That was a good lesson. And that's how my instructors spoke. If I got hit, they went, mm, good lesson. And I was like, good lesson? You just kicked the shit out of me. That hurt. What do you mean good lesson? They, they didn't explain. They didn't say anything else. They're just like, no, good lesson. That, that was the full explanation. Like, I did something bad, good lesson. And I was like, uh, okay, if you say so. But after a while, I took that. That became my thinking. He kicked me. Good lesson. Not, ow, not, not ouch. Uh, not, oh, man, you, you cheated. No, it was simply a good lesson. I will not let you do that again. And if you do do it again, a better lesson. I have to improve. It changed the way that I thought. It, it was like I was a hunk of crumpled metal, and they started to shape me into something that resembles a blade. It wasn't a functional blade yet. It was the beginning of what I might become someday. And once you can see that, once you can see that you may someday become a sword, you may someday become a Naginata blade, maybe maybe if you keep on doing what you're doing and you, you dedicate yourself to it, maybe you can become that thing. Maybe you can choose to never be hit. And better, you can turn that attack into something else. Uh, you can turn it into a disadvantage for them and an advantage for you. Once you can start to understand that, that is magic. That ability to use martial arts, to, to master a thing well enough that when somebody uses just fury against you and you respond calmly and with great skill, that's, that's really enticing. And to be able to own that skill, I, I would have, I, I remember the first time, the thing that I see most when people start to realize that they're starting to understand the martial arts, their reflexes start to get sharper. Something falls off a table and you catch it. Out of the corner of your eye, your body just reaches out and boom, you catch the thing. That's the first thing most people notice. And I noticed it when I was at, uh, do, can I tell you this story? Do I have a, Absolutely, hmm? please. So Stories are a, great. I was at a mall called Ala Moana. It's a, it's a big mall in Hawaii where we would go hang out at the bus stop after school. And so I went there and we're all hanging out. We're goofing around. And uh, I had to go into the mall. I had to go meet some people at the food court, I think. And the, the bus station was nowhere near the food court. So I was like, all right, you guys, I'll see you in a minute. And I think a penny fell out of my pocket. I was vaguely aware that it fell out, but it was just fell out on the, on the, the bench. And my friend was still sitting there. And uh, I could hear them laughing because we were all talking about something. And, and then all of a sudden, the laughter kind of uh, stopped in that suspicious way. You know, when everybody's like, <laughs> oh, you kind of hear that. I was vaguely aware of it because we were all goofing around and whacking each other or, or just talking silly things. 
But I was vaguely aware of that. And then I took steps because I was walking towards the food court. And then I was like, penny fell out of my pocket. They stopped laughing. Now, and I reached back and one of them had thrown the penny at me after I took about six or seven steps away. He threw it at my back. He was going to bing me with it. And I did not turn my head. I just put my hand out and the penny went whoop, right into the center of my hand. I did not look at it. And I heard them go, whoa, <laughs> right at that moment. Now, this, this is the part which would tell me eventually I was going to become an actor. I held that stance with my arm outstretched behind me with my eyes 180 degrees the opposite direction for about three seconds. I just held my hand out and I had caught the penny. Now, on my face, which they could not see, I was like, whoa. But when I turned my face around, I had this calm look like the master in a kung fu movie. I just turned around like, hmm. <laughs> they, they, the blood had drained from their faces, and they were looking at me like I walked off of a movie screen. And I nodded once. I turned around, and I walked back, and I had the biggest grin on my face. <laughs> they never saw that grin, but I had the biggest grin on my face. And I could hear them go, what did you see? How did you do that? Timing gets hammered into you. The way a physical body moves, the way it attacks, uh, those things start to make sense in a way that music makes sense to a composer. And that kind of ownership, that moment when a skill shines and burns bright in your your soul, and and then puts you up up center stage like that, uh, it, it, just like that for just a moment, you're like. Hmm. Practice is good. Pain is a good teacher. <laughs> that, that was amazing. And those moments, those kind of things make you take ownership. When you can see your skill develop, and, and I mean, little things happen, little tussles in school where they're not tussles anymore. It's not even a real fight. Somebody's trying to slap fight you or, or they kick you in a good-natured way because that's what boys do when they're young. Uh, and bullying. Bullying is empty when you know that the person trying to do the bullying, uh, it's scary. Sure, they might be bigger than you, but yeah, so are a lot of the people in my class. So, and I, and I spar with adults. So, eh, you said something about lunch or after school, and I'm like, hmm, okay. And when you have no reaction to that bullying, that bully saying the things, it really affects the bully. They're like, did you hear what I said? After school, I'm going to kick your butt. And I'm like, hmm, okay, we will see. And it, now you see a change in the bully. <laughs> and they're like, why is he not reacting the way he's supposed to? He's supposed to be scared. He scares everybody else, doesn't this? <laughs> and you can see it. And, and that's all learning. I, I hear, I know that there's a lot of bullying in the world. Uh, I don't remember that. I, I do remember the bullying, but I don't remember it being such a massive problem. I don't know if we didn't talk about it, but it, it is something that happens with humans. It is a natural thing that humans have to test their limits. Some have to test their power. Some have to be the test. And I think that it gives you strength. It, it shapes part of your childhood. It shapes part of your adult, but it shapes the human to have to endure those things. Uh, I think we need to give people the mechanisms to cope with those things. And I think martial arts is one of those potential mechanisms. I don't think you're going to stop bullying. Uh, but I do believe that we can help people understand that it is a natural part of our development and that we have to deal with it. Uh, I don't think that we have the same tools that we did when we were younger. Because when we were younger, we learned to endure it. Uh, so martial arts really really helped me endure those things and to deal with them in a very positive way. Yeah. Yeah. It, the, the bullying subject just, it keeps coming up. And even when it's not being brought up directly, I'm seeing it. I mean, it doesn't take much time on social media to see people who are related or claim to be friends treating each other horribly. Absolutely. And that online conversation turns to offline conversation. And I, I watch it and it blows my mind. You know, I was bullied. I, I think 
as you indicated, most of us were bullied in some way, mm -hmm. but we learned what it felt like to receive it. And a lot of us felt like it felt what it was like to dish it out and learned, you know what, this isn't a good thing on either end. And well, now we have these new formats to spread it as adults with little to no consequence. Yes. And uh, it's, it's an ugly time, but we have to, I, I, I wish that we took mental health more seriously because that is partially what it's about. Uh, of the victim, the person getting bullied, uh, they need to know what bullying is and how to deal with it. And then we can have that conversation. But I, I don't think we take uh, mental health seriously enough. I don't think we take these situations seriously enough because we have, we've evolved to deal with bullying. For the most part, there's always been a big, strong alpha kind of person saying, I'll take your food if you don't do this or get out of my way and let me do what I want. We've learned to deal with that. In one way or another, we've learned to deal with it. But that was our evolution. I think cultural evolution does not and cannot be contained. It changes so fast. And now that we have online sources, anybody can be a bully. And, and they are. And we haven't evolved to deal with these blind sighting bullies. And there's all kinds of bullies. There's ones that are right. There's ones that are wrong. But they're still bullies. And we have to learn how to deal with them. We have to learn how to cope with it. Uh, and we have to have conversations that will help deal with that and help everybody on both sides. And I agree. Martial arts has some tools that I think a lot more people would benefit from. And that's part of why we do what we do is to hopefully spread martial arts and, and get more people involved there. Now you brought up acting. You brought up this, this incredibly dramatic moment that very well could have come off screen. And I suspect changed your social standing with yes. your friend group <laughs> from yes. there on. I was now, uh, minutely cool <laughs> yeah yeah i i a complete spaz I, i've had a couple moments like that too where i just try to play it off like oh absolutely that's completely what i was trying to do <laughs> and it was not the one in a million yep. that actually worked out so we're just going to hold on to that yep. uh, as an aside it makes me wonder you know from my own experiences that story how many of these wonderful legends that we've passed down were just like that where the great grandmaster on the top of the mountain is like, I can't believe that worked. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I remember in, while, while being in class, I mean, some of those little legends in, in, in kung fu movies, when they fight, you always hear this. <laughs> and that's the sound of the, the weapons, their hands and feet snapping through the air. And I remember uh, doing a technique right once. And my sensei at the time said, hmm, that... That mm, with a slight no head nod, that, that was the biggest compliment you got. That was it. <laughs> not good job. Not bad boy. Nope. That was the gold. You just got the gold ticket. And I was like, but I remember when I did it right, my gi made a snapping sound. It went whoosh. I had rotated my hand and stopped my arm at the right distance with a little bit of bend in the elbow. And it came from my hip. I, everything worked. And he went, mm. and at that moment, I was like, it sounds just like in the Kung Fu movies. Like my gi snapped. It made a snapping whoosh sound. And now I knew how to equate proper technique with a badass Kung Fu sound. <laughs> and that is the sound that I went to. I tried to achieve that sound in every technique that I did. And it started to work, actually. My gi would snap when I, when I had snap in my kick, when I had a good torque in my fist. And I started to realize, ah. So this is how it's supposed to be. And that is where the myth came from. Good technique creates a snapping sound in your clothes. And maybe that's where the sounds in the, in the movies come from. Because you can't do that with everything. But I sure tried. <laughs> it was awesome. It was amazing. So I, I guess at some point we got to talk about this acting thing. Were there, was there a phase between what we've talked about? You know, you as a child, as a youth, training, taking ownership of that training, developing stopping pennies and getting on screen? I mean, is, there, is there a block of time? We don't have to go linear, but 
No, I literally became famous overnight. It was pretty sweet. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> it was. That's going to be disappointing to everyone who's listening who's worked hard and not made it yet. But let's go there. No, I didn't. That wasn't even the plan. It was magic to watch those people. It was absolutely magic. Um, but I, I have to say, I, it was not the plan. I was still a nerd and a complete super spaz for the most part. Uh, I was nerdy as hell. Like I said, I grew fast, which meant that my, my clothes tended to, my, my pants were always about an inch to two inches higher than my shoes. They were called high waters uh, back then. Like, oh, nice high waters, because I keep growing out of my clothes, and it would leave my socks exposed from my shoes. And uh, I was just such a nerd. And I would play Dungeons and Dragons. I was in, in the back of the class or at lunchtime playing with my friends Dungeons and Dragons using my imagination, uh, which was also super fueled by hyper energy and now martial arts. Uh, so we, we'd be playing all the time and there was nothing cool whatsoever about me. I was the, I was the tallest nerd and the, the most energetic nerd, but nothing cool whatsoever. And I, I wanted the dances started to come and, and girls started to matter to me. And I, there was, there was a, a girl named Chantel when I was a kid. Uh, she, she was stunning to me. Uh, she was, I think she was the, uh, was the chief or the coach or the, the head cheerleader. She was the head cheerleader. And I was just like, wow, she is amazing. She is amazing. My mind locked on Chantel. And I wanted to ask her to the dance and I was super nervous. And to be honest, I had, absolutely zero chance but you this is what you did you asked the girl to the dance and in the movies like 16 candles and all of those eventually somehow it worked out now life is not like the movies <laughs> so it did not work out but just like in the martial arts now i started and now i had a way to deal with that failure i thought to myself hmm she doesn't want to go with me hmm wonder what i can do to improve and there's a good teacher i can do better and I wanted to be better. I wanted to be the kind of person that she said yes to. So I started to change myself. I started working on myself. I looked around and I was like, hmm, I'm not cool. She went out with like the, maybe the top football player. She went out with somebody much, much, much cooler than me to the dance. And that stung. That was pain. And the pain taught me maybe I could be cool, cooler like him. Uh, what makes people cool? At the time, it was maybe breakdancing and to be an athlete, to be strong and athletically gifted and to be uh, popular because you were a dancer. So I did both things. Um, in Hawaii, there are two cultural races. There are Samoans and Tongans. They are both much bigger than me. So football, in my estimation, was not a good choice. <laughs> I would die on the football field because they're big and powerful and uh, hell no. But I figured basketball, they can't actually tackle you in basketball. They can check you, but they can't tackle you. So I was like, I will try basketball. And so I started playing basketball. And I took it just as seriously because martial arts had, had taught me how to train. And the more you practice, the better you get. Now, I was not the best by any leap of imagination, but I got way, way better because we had a great coach. Uh, it was uh, Coach Sherping, and then later uh, I had a, a Samoan coach named uh, Mr. Faliafini, and both of these coaches were hardcore, awesome coaches, old school. Uh, they yell at you, "Okay, ladies, get on the court. Let's get some laps in." And and they were super hardcore. They did not play, uh, and I loved it. I it was like being in karate. There was nothing. Uh, sweet about it. There was nothing soft about it. They ground you into the dirt. Your endurance had to be strong. You had to pay attention. It was just like being in karate. Some of the guys were be ready to throw up, at, but at least karate had forged me and my, my spirit and my discipline into a place where I could expect this, and this was normal. Uh, so I got better at basketball, and that was the work. Uh, that was the survival. The fun was dancing. I started to just stand in front of uh, the reflection at the chapel, and I would do one move that I, I knew that I could do. It was this, the wave from your right hand, the wave would go all the way up your right arm and down your left arm to your left, and then all the way back. I'd practice it over and over again. That's the only move I could do. And then uh, movies like uh, 
Breakin' and Beat Street and all these movies started coming out. And I was like, whoa. And I started copying all of those. And I became an, a really solid dancer. And I got, eventually I got a group and we started dancing. Eventually we became one of the best dance groups uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, we were called Fresh Force and we had the street enemy. Uh, what were they called? Uh, what? I can't remember their name. But in any case, uh, we had battles on the street like you, know, like you saw in the movies. And it was a great time to be a kid. It was epic. But I became a dancer. After all of that, I ended up becoming a professional dancer. I moved to Los Angeles. I kept on dancing. I, I did music videos. I did all kinds of fun stuff. But dancing doesn't pay the bills. And you don't feel, at the time, I didn't feel like it was appreciated. Uh, you're dancing for the singer. You're occasionally dancing for a fashion show or whatever it is, but you're like this, this part, a small part of a show that, yes, you love doing the thing, but it's not appreciated. And I, I don't know how I felt about that. And, and you didn't get paid really well, but you're, you're tearing your body up and tearing it down and building it back up again and healing and all this stuff. But I didn't feel like it was appreciated. So. I started to get burnt out on dancing. Uh, I loved it, but I had done it every single day for hours a day. And the love drove me, but it wasn't as fun anymore. I wasn't enjoying it. Anymore. Plus, I was further away from my friends. I moved from Hawaii to California to Los Angeles. So that part was gone too. And uh, I fell into a singing career. Uh, I was getting my hair cut, and the guy next to me is like, hey, do you sing? And I was like, yeah, sure. I was lying. I can't sing to save my life. <laughs> but it sounded really cool. Who doesn't want a record contract? He's like, well, let's see what you got. I was like, well, can I bring my friends? My, my friend, uh, Ben, my cousin, and uh, my other friend, John, and they can sing. And uh, so we, we showed up and they sang and I choreographed because I could dance. And together, we were a pretty good team. We did records. We got on the radio. It was great. Uh, we got completely screwed out of our contract. And that was the end of the music business. Now we had we'd done concerts and stuff, but, and, and that was in front of thousands of people. And that was really, really cool. But it was a kind of a dirty business. It was just right before digital music. So it was a good time to get out for us. We didn't know it. But at the same time, it was a painful les lesson. And pain is a good teacher. I, I was like, look, if I'm gonna get into a business where I'm gonna get screwed, at least I wanna see it coming. How about acting? How hard could that be? And I, I went there. Uh, it, I started going to casting calls and I got some parts because I was pretty tall and I could do martial arts. I didn't really think about the martial arts as a part of my business. I, it was just part of me. It was part of my being, but I didn't think it was a marketable skill. But I knew that they occasionally used it in movies. So I said, oh yeah, and I can do martial arts. And they're like, wait, you can do martial arts? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I didn't really think it's a big thing. but. It was a big thing. This is during the days of Kickboxer and American Samurai. And there were tons and tons of movies that needed martial arts. Every movie wanted a martial arts villain, a martial arts, martial arts hero, a martial arts fight. And because they had a lot of need and not a lot of money, they, they would be like, you, you can act and you're big and you can choreograph because the dance helped me understand timing and what looks good. I could do all of those things. So I got on the set and I started choreographing the fights, not really understanding how much I need, how much more I needed to know, but it's a good teacher to be on set. And I started to do that. And I started to see my mistakes once it was filmed and it was real film, it wasn't digital. So it wasn't a quick turnaround. But when the movie came out, I was like, ooh, this looks horrible. I see the idea was there, but the camera's in the wrong place. And I started to learn through that. And fortunately, I got paid a little bit or nothing for the first 10 years, but uh, I got to work on tons and tons of kickboxing movies. And I learned, in a, it's like being in film school, except these people, it was survival for them. So we tried to do the best thing that we could every time. And it was fun. Doing the martial arts on film was amazing. And occasionally I would talk. And, and then after doing it for 10 years, I went to acting school. I went to uh, an amazing Meisner school in Santa Monica, Joanne Barron. And uh, that's where I realized, oh my God, 
I cannot act. Not, <laughs> not even a little. I am horrible. I am, I've done so many movies. Oh my God, I can't act. <laughs> Just realized I've done all these movies and I knew nothing about acting. And I acted in them. I did act in the movies, but I was horrible. And I, I did not understand why. Oddly, the martial arts is exactly opposite of what you need to act. <laughs> I did not know that at all. Um, martial arts, somebody hits you, and you they could hit you square in the face, but the martial arts teaches you to be stoned. There is no reaction. There may be pain, but you will deal with it. But you will deal with the person in front of you without reaction. You will give them nothing. Give the enemy nothing. Somebody hits you in a movie, give them everything. <laughs> Show them your vulnerability. Open your heart. Let the tears come. Martial arts have taught me there are no tears. There are no vulnerability. I will not fall. I will, you will not stop me. I will not be put down. Acting wanted to be open yourself up. Show every single thing. And I had trained to not do any of that. So that was the new path. That was my new martial art. Uh, the art of being vulnerable, really, and listening. Those were the things that I had to learn. And I did. Uh, my acting skills are not as strong as my martial arts skills because I trained them a fraction of the time, but they trained just as hard. They do not play. The school was just like my martial arts school, which I absolutely loved. Uh, it was scary to watch them occasionally tear an actor apart for A, not practicing, B, not being dedicated, uh, C, not taking it seriously. But those are the same things that would tear apart a normal person in karate. And karate and kung fu and those things have taught me, take it seriously, practice. Uh, this is real. Treat it as real. And because I practiced, because I took it seriously, because I had a deep background in the martial arts, I started to excel in the acting. I started to learn. I started to not suck. And eventually, not sucking became being okay. Being okay became being a solid actor. And flash forward a little bit, uh, I have a career, again, thanks to the martial arts. Uh, and thanks to very patient teachers, both martial arts teachers, all the martial arts between karate, taekwondo, kung fu, capoeira, uh, all the, martial, the Filipino martial arts that I got to train. Thank you to all of those amazing teachers that I had. And thank you to my acting teachers, because that, I imagine, would be far more painful to watch. <laughs> <laughs> they had to sit there and watch me fumble through trying to pretend to be drunk, trying to bring a tear to my eye painfully over long months. <laughs> that was painful to watch. I have no that I've never caused a teacher pain until that moment. That was the first time that my teachers probably felt pain was watching me try that. Wow. You, you know what I find most interesting the way you're talking about your acting is that up until this point, everything you've talked about has been I'm going to do this. I'm going to conquer this. I'm going to get through this. I will find a way. I will get around it or, or above it. You know, whatever has to happen. Was it really as abrupt a wall as you're talking about that you just said, this isn't going to happen? Imagine everything, excuse me. Imagine everything that you know, everything that you understand being the exact opposite of what you need at that given moment. Uh, imagine trying to drive a car, but for some reason, the reverse is where the first gear is, and the first gear is exactly where the reverse is. Mm. And now you have to navigate all of that on a freeway. You have to get up to speed as fast as you can. You have to reverse everything. Everything that I had understood, everything that I knew, be strong, be stronger, do not quit, push, us, Begin here, end here. Give this person space. Don't press this person. Don't press the attack. Let the attack press it. I, all of those things I could not use in the same way here. Uh, now it was just, no, no, no. Just sit there. Just be. I, I said, mm, I will sit. I will be. <laughs> I was like a statue. And then when the actor tried to say something to me, <clears throat> it bounced off. They said, uh, you're a jerk. And I said, hmm, so I'm a jerk. <laughs> there was no reaction. She's like, how does that make you feel? I was like, it does not. 
I am prepared for this. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the worst? They're like, no, 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 no. She called you a jerk. How does it feel? I'm like, it, it is true. I, I do not care. It is fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was so zen and un, unfeeling about that moment. She's like, no, 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 no. Inside, it makes you feel a certain way. I'm like, perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> but there was nothing there. I had no connection to my inside life. I built this stone warrior around it to protect that thing inside of me. And, uh, and that's great for the world when it's a hostile world. It is not great when you need to let that child be affected on the inside mm. to go back to that thing on the inside. And that really threw me off balance. It took me a while, but <clears throat> the only thing that I had to realize was, ah, you want me to take my armor off. That's it. Oh, it, nobody, they didn't know that that's what they were dealing with. But it took me literally, it took me two and a half years to figure out. And I remember the night that it happened. <clears throat> I have an amazing acting teacher. Her name was Annie Draymond. She was my teacher at Joanne Barron. And she had me doing this, uh, I think the, movie, the, the, the scene was from a movie called The Hustler, I think. And my partner uh, was a woman, her name was Stacia. And Stacia was saying something. And all the lessons up until that two and a half year mark, all the lessons finally built up. And when you forgot a line, you were supposed to repeat. Or, or if somebody else forgot a line, you just repeat your last line. That way, you kind of drill it in. And she was saying her lines to me. We'd done the lines. And I usually said, she said, blah, blah, blah. And I would say, blah, 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 back because that was my line. But this time she was saying it and I had just figured out, oh, remove the armor. And in the middle of the scene, for the very first time in a long time, her words affected me. They affected the child inside, the, the soul. And I was like, oh. and I cared about her enough and I cared about my character, cared enough about her character. I cared enough about her to let them affect me deeply. And I was like, oh. and it, it was like a kick that takes your air away. Her words stabbed me. And that pain went in. And my teacher and my partner thought that I had forgotten my line because it stabbed me. I was like, oh. So she repeated. And my teacher, she always had a pencil in her hand. She goes, repeat. And she was telling me, repeat her last line so that your line can come to you. It's a little trick. It's all based on repetition. I didn't need to. I could feel the words coming but they were coming from the place of hurt. I was reacting from pain, which is what I had avoided doing as a martial artist, but that's what they wanted here in the acting. And when that pain came, I released those words back. And I saw the effect, not only on my partner, she actually stepped back because they were venomous. I, when I was coming back, I was fighting you know, from pain. Uh, everybody in class who's usually either on their phones or writing notes to them so their heads are down and they're bored out of their mind because they've seen this scene 10 times already. Uh, all of a sudden, all the heads in the room lifted and all the postures leaned forward. It's something that changed. In this moment, these words meant something. What she did to me meant something. She meant something to me. And in that moment, I started to take ownership of the new skill. I started to understand what it meant to act. And then I found the art, the martial art of the acting. I said, ah, this is it. I said it afterwards because I was so in the moment, uh, but I could feel it. In that moment, I was like, something's changing. And it was weird. That night when I walked out, I usually looked at the, out, the outer physical parts of people, but now I could see the subtext in people's conversations as I walked down Third Street Promenade. I could see couples that were brand new and you could tell that they had that shiny new relationship plastic over there <laughs> and they were all into each other. I could see couples that were, had been married for years and I could see that comfortableness uh, with each other or a bare tolerance. I could start to see the stories in people because I was now looking at more than their outside physical being, which is what I would often spar with when I was in martial arts, I could see the, the part 
that the actor speaks to, the emotional spirit, the, the core. And that changed the way that I perceived the world. And that was a great experience. It was a great time to grow. It was a wonderful lesson. And it took a lot of pain <laughs> for me to, unfortunately, the, the pain was my teacher's, <laughs> but it took a lot of pain to uh, get to that point. What did that process do for your personal life? It changed it. It changed it. It, it helped me start to be able to communicate. And you, you say, a lot of people say communicate like, oh, talk. But that's half of it. I was very good at that first half, the talking part. But now I could receive information. It is the yin and the yang. And I was good at the yang. I could output words all the time. Here's my opinion. My opinion, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't really... I heard the physical vibrations of their voice hitting me, but I did not take in what they were saying. But as an actor, you do want to take it in and you want to let it affect you. And for the first time that started to happen. And I became, uh, a, 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 I think I became a better person, a better communicator, but definitely a better person as a result. And I think, again, the martial arts helped me understand, ah, this is the other side of that. This is the yin. I was missing this piece. This, this is important. This is part of being human. Hmm. I'll train more in this. And that's kind of what I started to understand. It, it made me a fuller person to be able to understand people uh, better, to really hear what they're saying and to feel their pain or, or share their joy. Those things are important because sometimes people tell you they're good news. Like, oh my God. I, I, we just had a child and I'd be like, yay. That's it's biological, right? <laughs> but now <laughs> from this point, from this part on, I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. And I could feel, I could feel their joy because I opened myself up to it. And, and that wasn't natural for me. I trained that away to some extent, uh, and it was just a natural part of my being. I wasn't trying to be tough. It was just part of my training, uh, partially. And, and now that opened me up and I started to understand. And I was like, wow, that is amazing. And it, so it made me a better person overall. That's fascinating. There, there's a self-awareness in there that I've rarely heard from anyone, you know, on or off the show. And it's pretty impressive. So hey. let, let's complete that circle. You know, so martial arts leads to armor brings you to a place where you have the opportunity to learn the ability to shed that armor when appropriate, which leads to further personal development. And so how does that tie back in? How has that affected your martial arts? Um, it affected it in a lot of ways. I started to realize that there is a deeper yin to the martial arts. Uh, for instance, the, the, one of the schools that I trained in said uh, it is to, to avoid a fight is best. Now, when you're between, I don't know, 15 and 30, you're kind of down for a fight. <laughs> you're like, fight? I've trained for this. Yes, let's fight. <laughs> I want to crush you. Uh, and, and you're open to the idea of, I will defeat you. That is what needs to happen. Uh, but thankfully, because I, I have a deeper understanding of the yin, um, first off, the good part of martial arts is it teaches you the cost of pain. Pain is a cost in itself. It hurts. And pain is, usually shows up as injury, as bruises. They are good lessons, but they hurt, man. And it takes time to recover. And that's time that is lost. You can't do all of the moving, all of the fun stuff that you want to be doing while your finger is broken, while your hamstring is pulled, while your shoulder is, is out of socket. You can't do all of those things. So you start, to, you start to take that more seriously. When you get hurt, you start to realize the empathic cost of it. If I hurt this person, they're going to feel the same kind of pain I felt. I've had a collarbone hairline fracture. You would think that that would not ruin your entire livelihood as much as it does, but you can't grab a cup off the top cupboard if you can't raise your hand above your pectoral muscle. But 
the collarbone is attached to that. So every time that happens, there's that pain. So every single instance of injury you start to respect and you respect it in yourself. I, I can't raise my arm above my, my, my uh, chest without hurting and wanting to scream. And you, you, you also respect that in others. If I hit him there, if I break him, if I commit to this combat, I am going to hurt this human beyond their ability to operate, or worse, their ability to repair if, if it's a serious fight. I would very much not like to visit that kind of pain on another human, and I don't want to open myself up and expose myself to the possibility of that kind of pain either. It, but the acting made me think, oh, can we not talk about this? Perhaps you're right. Or maybe I'll just eat my ego completely. If it's a complete bully at a bar going, hey, you're that martial art guy. You're supposed to be able to fight. I, I will just eat it. I'll be like, you know what? That is the movies. You would kick my ass. You look tough, bro. Nope, I'm not biting you. And they're like, yup, yup. And I'm like, yup. And that is the end. I win. I don't have to fight. I may look like not the toughest person in the room for about three seconds, but it's all good. There's no pain that day. Nobody has to feel any pain. We don't have to prove anything. I don't have to be tough. I, I don't have to get injured. He doesn't have to get injured. Life is better with just a little bit of yin added to the yang. When you can live in that balance and find that way out, that's a better place. And I wouldn't have done that in my 20s. It'd be like, perhaps I am. <laughs> perhaps I am tough enough. No. <laughs> I I don't need to do that. It's not necessary. So uh, I'm really grateful to, and, and, and as a person overall, I mean, rarely does one need the full level of skills but when you to fight. But when you need them, you need them. Uh, and that's great. They're in my back pocket. They live in my bones. And I've trained for this. But the other 98% of my life, I need the soft skills. And that has helped me on the other side as well. Now, the martial arts does permeate every part of it. So that, that other 98% is, has an understructure of martial arts. My, I understand the world through the martial arts because that is where a great deal of my training came from. My grit comes from the martial arts. My discipline, my focus, uh, all of that comes from the martial arts and what I understand, and my parents. But... Uh, the yin side of it has helped me immensely. And it's made me, like I said, a better person and helped me in my relationships and my communications. Overall, it's, it's an excellent thing. Now let's turn our eyes to the future. We've talked a lot about where you're, where you're at, where you've been more specifically, but what's coming? I don't know, man. It, there's so much. It, in 2019, it, I got to be the predator. Uh, I was Colossus in Deadpool. Uh, I am Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Literally, I play those characters in those movies. Um, I, Darth Vader, I, I play it, uh, Darth Vader in uh, Star Wars uh, Jedi Fallen Order and Darth Vader Immortal. Uh, and, dude. <laughs> <laughs> How do you top that? Not bad for a kid who said, I, I don't want to play the piano anymore, Mom. That's awesome. That's amazing. I, I don't know, man. I, we're, we're already working on stuff. We're already shooting stuff now. Um, more video games, more, more films, uh, both live action and uh, performance capture, motion capture. Uh, I, I run a school called the Mind's Eye Tribe, uh, and you can find us on mindseyetribe.com. Uh, we're an action actors academy. So if you want to do the kind of stuff that I do, whether it's uh, fight movies or use swords or lightsabers uh, or use tactical weaponry and firearms and, and learn how to make it look cool for film, or, or you just want to act and move like a creature, uh, we teach all of that. We teach it primarily for motion capture and performance capture, but we also teach it for film and television because the skills cross over to everything. Uh, we teach it with the base of martial arts in mind because we understand if you don't practice, uh, I can show you all kinds of stuff. You'll remember about 3% of it and then it'll fade pretty quickly after you leave the class. But if you keep on training with us, 
well, then you're going to get strong. You're going to get really, really good. And that's kind of what we do. So if you have people, please send them over to the Mind's Eye Tribe, Action Actors Academy, and we'll help them do that. But that's kind of what we're doing. We, we're sharing those skills, the skills that my senseis, the philosophies, and the grit that my senseis gave me. We're trying to share those with uh, the new generation of performers who want to tell these stories of heroes and villains, the stuff that kept my imagination alive and, and, and gave fire to my training when I was a kid. Uh, because a lot of the, those long training hours were nothing in comparison to what I imagined uh, the guy in the 36 chambers. Uh, <laughs> they put concrete blocks on his feet and he had to jump out of a pit. If he could do that, I could practice for an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> those, those kind of things gave fire to my training when I was a kid. I was like, I can do it. If he could do that, I can do that. And I literally walked around for three months with five pound weights on each ankle to get stronger so that my kicks would be faster so that I could jump higher in basketball. Those are the things that those, those stories instilled in me. The, the ability to not give up, to you, you can beat the bad guy eventually. You can overcome the obstacles. Those stories spoke to my soul, and though in my senseis uh, fed my mind the information and my body the information it needed, and they kept my spirit steady. So all of those things combined really, really helped me get to where I am. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks uh, for coming it's been on. A blast. Thank you for having me. This is amazing. What number uh, episode is this for you guys? Uh, you're going to be 470, I think. What? Congratulations, yeah, man. 470 yeah. people speaking about... Well, to, to be fair, uh, we do one a week and then the other episode each week is not an interview. Phil, you know, content, you know, yeah, that, yeah. that is the martial arts. That's yeah. it. Yeah. You keep on doing it. You do not quit. You do not falter. You commit to twice a week. And that is yeah. absolutely amazing. Yeah, we're coming but up they, on five years. Yes, that's a, that's a hundred a year almost, man. <laughs> right. Congratulations. That yes. is really, really amazing. And, and. Thank you for having this resource. I oh. can't imagine uh, having an, an opportunity to hear so many other people's experiences. You're a literal audio library of yeah. knowledge and wisdom for martial artists. I think this is invaluable. And thank you for doing this. Uh, it's, it's an absolute wonderful thing to have this resource available to a young martial artist or an old martial artist, it doesn't matter to have this wisdom and this knowledge of, I, you have some amazing people who have trained in various, various facets. And you guys also have some really, really great knowledge uh, to talk about. And I think those things are invaluable. So thank you for, for doing all of that work. Yeah. Thank, thanks for being a part of it. And one more thing is, as we head out, you know, I love doing this part too. You've shared some absolutely wonderful things, but if you were to kind of distill it down into some, into some final words for everyone, what would that be? Joseph Campbell wrote a book called Hero with a Thousand Faces. Uh, and in, in, in he, he's an amazing, what he did is he went around the world and he listened to everybody's stories. And in all of those stories, he found that we all more or less tell the same stories, especially the hero stories. We tell the same stories around the world. Uh, the hero comes from the normal world. He realizes that there's a bigger world outside the door. He decides not to go, but his people need him, so he has to go. And he goes out and he takes, or she takes, the hero's journey. Um, but that's what he's known for, Joseph Campbell. But uh, what he said was, follow your bliss. Follow that thing that fires up your soul. For me, it was martial arts and performing. And that is where I am today. I am a martial artist that gets to perform. I get to act. I get to do action acting. I, I love it. It makes me so happy. And then I get to enjoy it on screen with people at the movie theater. They're screaming. They don't necessarily know that I'm sitting there next to them, but they're, they're cheering or they're, <gasps> they're doing all of that. And I'm smiling because it worked. It did the thing. And that is the end of the circle. Uh, it begins with the training. It ends with affecting the people and hopefully getting to do it again someday. So follow your bliss. And then in the words of Joseph Campbell, follow your bliss. I think that is the most important. Um, second, 
have a mom that won't let you quit. <laughs> <laughs> that helps a lot. A mom, a partner, a friend, somebody that holds you accountable. That will help a lot. But follow your bliss and don't quit. I don't think anyone would disagree that Sensei Storm is passionate about his work and his training. And I always find it interesting how people start so similarly with their martial arts and then spider off to do such amazing and different things. Thank you for coming on the show, sir. And I hope to talk to you again soon. If you want more, head over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. There you can find videos, links, social media, pictures, and more. Not just for this episode, but for everyone we've ever made. If you're up for supporting us and the work we do, you have a number of options. You can make a purchase at whistlekick.com. And if you do, don't forget the code PODCAST15. Saves you 15%. You can also share an episode, leave a review, tell a friend, or contribute to our Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. We'd love to hear your guest suggestions. So don't be afraid to reach out. Our social media accounts get a lot of activity and you can find us all over the place at Whistlekick. My personal email, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>